Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the American Academy in Berlin. Thank you very much for joining us this evening on an especially attractive spring evening uh, in Berlin, in Wannsee. Uh, we drew the curtain so that you could all concentrate uh, on what is happening at the front of the room, because frankly, the back of the room through the curtains is also very beautiful. Uh, but I'll start unusually by reminding you that we'll have a reception uh, after the lecture and the question and answer period. Uh, and that reception, we hope, will spill over to the terrace and feel free. Uh, I hope that's allowed. Uh, anyway, feel free to do that. Uh, in addition to welcoming you, it's an enormous pleasure and honor to welcome uh, Michael Sandel, who will speak to us tonight on populism, Trump, and the future of democracy. These are themes and problems that we are all thinking about uh, as scholars and even more so as citizens. Uh, it's also a set of themes that the American Academy has been thinking about and emphasizing uh, over the course of the current uh, fall and spring semesters uh, through the work of several of our fellows, uh, through the work of several uh, distinguished visitors. Uh, and just last week in an inaugural program in New York City, a collaboration with the New School for Social Research uh, a long afternoon uh, packed house seminar featuring eight of our alumni fellows uh, on the theme of transatlantic perspectives uh, on the new populism and nationalism, um, a situation that has become even more intense uh, with the elections in Hungary over this uh, last weekend. Uh, this lecture tonight is the Airbus lecture, and it's equally important and equally sincere for us to express gratitude to Airbus for for their support of this visit and for their support of the American Academy in its mission to facilitate transatlantic exchange in public and economic policy, as well as in the arts and the humanities. Uh, it's a delight to welcome Michael Sandel back to Berlin, where he spoke in spring 2013 about his then new book, Justice, um, at an event that we held at the Ulstein Verlag uh, in their offices downtown. Uh, Michael Sandel, as you know, is a political philosopher and the Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of Government at Harvard University, where he has taught political philosophy since 1980. Professor Sandel's latest book, What Money Can't Buy, which you can buy for a little bit of money, uh, <laughs> but uh, What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets, uh, describes how market values have crowded out non-market norms in almost every aspect of life, medicine, education, government, law, art, sports, and even family life and personal relations. Justice, uh, Sandel's widely acclaimed 2010 book, uh, was written to accompany his extremely famous justice course at Harvard University, which he has taught for more than 30 years. Justice is the first Harvard course to be made freely available online and on television. It has been viewed by uh, the number we discussed earlier today, 30 million people uh, around the world, 30 million people around the world. Uh, Professor Sandel's other books include Liberalism and the Limits of Justice, Democracy's Discontent, Public Philosophy, Essays on Morality and Politics, and The Case Against Perfection, Ethics in the Age of Gen Genetic Engineering. His writings have been translated into 27 languages. Uh, it's a delight to welcome Michael Sandel uh, to the Academy. Uh, we'll have time for some questions and answers after uh, his talk. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, please wait for a microphone uh, to reach you. Uh, tell us very briefly who you are, uh, also for the benefit of people who will be listening uh, on, uh, on, on, online. Uh, and then uh, please do ask a question, uh, which <laughs> always, always makes that part of the evening uh, more crisp and, and more fun. So please welcome Professor Sandel. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. We gather at a time when democracy is in danger. Russia, Turkey, Hungary, Poland, and other places that once offered democratic hope are now, in varying degrees, falling into authoritarianism. Democracy is also in trouble in sturdier places. In the US, 
Donald Trump poses the gravest threat to the American constitutional order <coughs> since Richard Nixon. And yet, despite the floundering first year and a half of Trump's presidency, the opposition has yet to find its voice. One might think that Trump's inflammatory tweets, erratic behavior, and persistent disregard for democratic norms would offer the opposition an easy target. But it hasn't worked out this way. For those who would mount a politics of resistance, the outrage Trump provokes has been less energizing than paralyzing. This is for two reasons. One is the investigation by special counsel Robert Mueller into the Trump campaign's possible collusion with Russia. The hope that Mueller's findings will lead to the impeachment of Trump is wishful thinking that distracts Democrats from asking hard questions about why voters have rejected them, not only for the presidency, but at the federal and state level. A second source of paralysis lies in the chaos Trump creates. His steady stream of provocations has a disorienting effect on critics who struggle to discriminate between the more consequential affront to democracy and passing distractions. The Italian writer Italo Calvino once wrote, I spent the first 20 years of my life with Mussolini's face always in view. Trump, too, is always in view, thanks partly to his tweets and, and partly to the insatiable appetite of television news to cover his every outrageous antic. Moral outrage can be politically energizing, but only if it is channeled and guided by political judgment. What the opposition to Trump needs now is an economy of outrage disciplined by the priorities of an affirmative political project. What might such a project look like? That's the question I'd like to try to answer tonight. And to answer this question, we have to begin by facing up to the complacencies of establishment political thinking that opened the way to Trump in the US and to right-wing populism in Britain and Europe in the first place. The hard reality is that Donald Trump was elected by tapping a wellspring of anxieties, frustrations, and legitimate grievances to which the mainstream parties have no compelling answer. This means that for those worried about Trump and about populism, it's not enough to mobilize a politics of protest and resistance. It is also necessary to engage in a politics of persuasion. Such a politics must begin by understanding the discontent that is roiling politics in the US and in democracies around the world. Like the triumph of Brexit in the UK, the election of Trump was an angry verdict on decades of rising inequality and a version of globalization that benefits those at the top but leaves ordinary people feeling disempowered. It was also a rebuke for a technocratic approach to politics that is tone deaf to the resentments of people who feel the economy and the culture have left them behind. Some denounce the upsurge of populism as little more than a racist, xenophobic reaction against immigrants and multiculturalism. Others see it mainly in economic terms as a protest against the job losses brought about by global trade and new technologies. But it's a mistake. It's a mistake to see only the bigotry in populist protest or to view it only as an economic complaint. 
to do so misses the fact that the upheavals we are witnessing are a political response to a political failure of historic proportions. The right-wing populism ascendant today is a symptom of the failure of progressive politics. The Democratic Party in the US has become a party of technocratic liberalism, more congenial to the professional classes than to the blue collar and middle class voters who once constituted its base. A similar predicament afflicted Britain's Labour Party and led, following its defeat in the last general election, to the surprising election of anti-establishment figure Jeremy Corbyn as party leader. The roots of the predicament go back to the 1980s. Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher had argued that government was the problem and markets were the solution. When they passed from the political scene, the center-left politicians who succeeded them, Bill Clinton in the US, Tony Blair in Britain, Gerhard Schroeder in Germany, they moderated but consolidated the market faith. They softened the harsh edges of unfettered markets. But they did not challenge the central premise of the Reagan-Thatcher era, namely, that market mechanisms are the primary instruments for achieving the public good. In line with this faith, they embraced a market-driven version of globalization, and they welcomed the growing financialization of the economy. In the 1990s, the Clinton administration joined with Republicans in promoting global trade agreements and deregulating the financial industry. The benefits of these policies flowed mostly to those at the top, but Democrats did little to address the deepening inequality and the growing power of money in politics. Having strayed from its traditional mission of taming capitalism and holding economic power to democratic account, liberalism lost its capacity to inspire. Now, all, all this seemed to change when Barack Obama appeared on the political scene. In his 2008 presidential campaign, he offered a stirring alternative to the managerial, technocratic language that had come to characterize liberal public discourse. He showed that progressive politics could speak a language of moral and spiritual purpose. But the moral energy and civic idealism he inspired as a candidate did not carry over into his presidency. Assuming office in the midst of the financial crisis, he appointed economic advisors who had promoted financial deregulation during the Clinton years. With their encouragement, he bailed out the banks on terms that did not hold them to account for the behavior that led to the crisis, and that offered little help for ordinary citizens who had lost their homes. This was the decisive choice. His moral voice muted. Obama placated rather than articulated the seething public anger toward Wall Street. Lingering anger over the bailout would cast a shadow over the Obama presidency and would ultimately fuel a mood of populist protest that reached across the political spectrum. On the left, the Occupy movement and the candidacy of Bernie Sanders. On the right, the Tea Party movement and the election of Trump. The populist uprising in the US, Britain, and Europe is a backlash against elites of the mainstream parties, but its most conspicuous casualties have been liberal and center-left political parties. The Democratic Party in the US, the Labor Party in Britain, the Social Democratic Party in Germany, Italy's Democratic Party, the Socialist Party in France, whose presidential nominee won only 6% of the vote in the first round of the, of the election. Before they can hope to win back public support, progressive or center-left parties must rethink their mission and purpose. And to do so, they should learn from the populist protest that has displaced them 
not by replicating its xenophobia and strident nationalism, but by taking seriously the legitimate grievances with which these ugly sentiments are entangled. Such rethinking should begin with the recognition that these grievances are not only economic, they're also moral and cultural. They're not only about wages and jobs, but also about social esteem. Let me offer four themes that progressive parties need to grapple with if they hope to address the anger and resentment that royal politics today. So here are the four. Income inequality, what I call meritocratic hubris, the dignity of work, and patri patriotism and national community. Let me say a little bit about each of these four themes. First, income inequality. The standard response to inequality is to call for greater equality of opportunity, retraining workers who've, whose jobs have disappeared due to globalization and technology, improving access to higher education, removing barriers of race, ethnicity, and gender. This project is summed up in the slogan that those who work hard and play by the rules should be able to rise as far as their talents will take them. You've heard this slogan reiterated in contemporary politics. But it now rings increasingly hollow. In today's economy, it's not easy to rise. This is a special problem for the US, which prides itself on upward mobility. Americans have traditionally worried less than Europeans about inequality, believing that whatever one's initial starting point in life, it is possible with hard work to rise from rags to riches. But today, this belief is in doubt. Americans born to poor parents tend to stay poor as adults. Of those born in the bottom fifth of the income scale, 43% will remain there. And only 4% will make it to the top fifth. It's easier to rise from poverty in Germany, in Canada, in Sweden, and many European countries than it is in the US. This may partly explain why the rhetoric of opportunity fails to inspire as it once did. And so progressives should reconsider the assumption that mobility can compensate for inequality. They should reckon directly with inequalities of power and wealth rather than rest content with the project of, help, of helping people scramble up a ladder whose rungs grow further and further apart. But the problem runs deeper, which takes me to the second theme, meritocratic hubris. The relentless emphasis on creating a fair meritocracy in which social positions really do reflect effort and talent this has a corrosive effect on the way we interpret our success or the lack of it. The notion that the system rewards talent and hard work encourages the winners to consider their success, their own doing, a measure of their virtue, and to look down upon those less fortunate than themselves. Those who lose out may complain that the system is rigged, that the winners have cheated and manipulated their way to the top, or they may harbor the demoralizing thought that their failure is their own doing, that they simply lack the talent and drive to succeed. Now, when these sentiments coexist, as invariably they do, they make for a volatile brew of anger and resentment against elites that fuels populist protest. Though himself a billionaire, Donald Trump understands and exploits this resentment. Unlike Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, who spoke constantly of opportunity, Trump scarcely mentions the word. Instead, he, talks, he offers blunt talk of winners and losers. Liberals and progressives have so valorized a college degree 
both as an avenue for advancement and as the basis for social esteem, that they have difficulty understanding the hubris a meritocracy can generate and the harsh judgment it imposes on those who have not gone to college. Such attitudes are at the heart of the populist backlash and Trump's victory. One of the deepest political divides in American politics today is between those with and those without a college degree. To heal this divide, Democrats need to understand the attitudes toward merit and work it reflects. The third theme is the dignity of work. The loss of jobs to technology and outsourcing has coincided with a sense that society accords less respect to the kind of work the working class does. As economic activity has shifted from making things to managing money, as society has lavished outsized rewards on, on hedge fund managers and Wall Street bankers, the esteem accorded work in the traditional sense has become fragile and uncertain. New technologies may further erode the dignity of work. Some Silicon Valley visionaries anticipate a time when robots and artificial intelligence will render many of today's jobs obsolete. And so to ease the way for such a future, they propose paying everyone a basic income. What was once justified as a safety net for all citizens is now offered as a way to soften the transition to a world without work. Whether such a world is a prospect to welcome or to resist is a question that will be central to politics in the coming years. To think it through, political parties will have to grapple with the meaning of work and its place in a good life. The fourth theme is patriotism and national community. Free trade agreements and immigration. These are the two most potent flashpoints of populist fury. On one level, the, these are economic issues. Opponents argue that free trade agreements and immigration threaten local jobs and wages, while proponents reply that they help the economy in the long run. But the passion these issues evoke suggests that something more is at stake. Workers who believe their country cares more for cheap goods and cheap labor than for the job prospects of its own people feel betrayed. This sense of betrayal often finds ugly intolerant expression, a hatred of immigrants, a strident nationalism that vilifies Muslims and other outsiders, a rhetoric of taking back our country. Liberals reply by condemning the hateful rhetoric and insisting on the virtues of mutual respect and multicultural understanding. But this principled response, valid though it is, fails to address an important set of questions implicit in the populist complaint. What is the moral significance, if any, of national borders? Do we owe more to our fellow citizens than we owe citizens of other countries? In a global age, should we cultivate national identities? Or should we aspire to a cosmopolitan ethic of universal human concern? These questions may seem daunting, a far cry from the small things we discuss in politics these days. But the populist uprising highlights the need to rejuvenate democratic public discourse, to address the big questions people care about, including moral and cultural questions. Now, any attempt to address questions like these, to reimagine the terms of democratic public discourse, faces a powerful obstacle. It requires that we rethink a central premise of contemporary liberalism. It requires that we question the idea that the way to a tolerant society is to avoid engaging in substantive moral argument in politics. This principle of avoidance, this insistence that citizens leave their moral and spiritual convictions outside when they enter the public square, is a powerful temptation. 
It seems to avoid the danger that the majority may impose its values on the minority. It seems to prevent the possibility that a morally overheated politics will lead to wars of religion. It seems to offer a secure basis for mutual respect. But this strategy of avoidance, this insistence on liberal neutrality, is a mistake. It ill-equips us to address the moral and cultural issues that animate the populist re revolt. For how is it possible to discuss the meaning of work and its role in a good life without debating competing conceptions of the good life? How is it possible to think through the proper relation of national and global identities without asking about the virtues such identities express and the moral claims they make upon us? Liberal neutrality flattens questions of meaning, identity, and purpose into questions of fairness. It therefore misses the anger and resentment that animate the popular, populist revolt. It lacks the moral and rhetorical and sympathetic resources to understand the cultural estrangement, even humiliation, that many working class and middle class voters feel. And it ignores the meritocratic hubris of elites. Donald Trump is keenly alive to the politics of humiliation. From the standpoint of economic fairness, his populism is fake, a kind of plutocratic populism. His health plan would have cut health care for many of his working class supporters to fund massive tax cuts for the wealthy. But to focus solely on this hypocrisy misses the point. When he withdrew the US from the Paris Climate Change Agreement, Trump argued implausibly that he was doing so to protect American jobs. But the real point of his decision, its political rationale, was contained in this seemingly stray remark, quote, we don't want other countries and other leaders to laugh at us anymore. That's what he said. Liberating the US from the supposed burdens of the climate change agreement then was not really about jobs or about global warming. It was, in Trump's political imagination, about averting humiliation. This resonates with Trump voters, even those who care about climate change. For those left behind, by three decades of market-driven globalization, the problem is not only wage stagnation and the loss of jobs. It is also the loss of social esteem. It's not only about unfairness. It's also about humiliation. Mainstream liberal and social democratic politicians miss this dimension of politics. They think the problem with globalization is simply a matter of distributive justice. Those who have gained from global trade, new technologies, the financialization of the economy, have not adequately compensated those who have lost out. But this misunderstands the populist complaint. It also reflects a defect in the public philosophy of contemporary liberalism. Many liberals distinguish between neoliberalism, or laissez-faire free market thinking, and the liberalism that finds expression in what philosophers call, call liberal public reason. The first, neoliberalism, is an economic doctrine, whereas the second is a principle of political morality that insists government should be neutral toward competing conceptions of the good life. Notwithstanding this distinction, there is a philosophical affinity between the neoliberal faith in market reasoning and the principle of liberal neutrality. The affinity, the parallel, is this. Market reasoning is appealing because it seems to offer a way to resolve contested public questions without engaging in contentious debates about how goods are properly valued. When two people make a deal, they decide for themselves what value to place on the goods they exchange. Similarly, liberal neutrality is appealing because it seems to offer a way 
of defining and justifying rights without presupposing any particular conception of the good. But the neutrality is spurious in both cases. Markets are not morally neutral instruments for defining the public good, and liberal public reason is not a morally neutral way of arriving at principles of justice. Conducting our public discourse as if it were possible to outsource moral judgment to markets or to procedures of liberal public reason has created an empty, impoverished public discourse, a vacuum of public meaning. Such empty public spaces are invariably filled by narrow, intolerant, authoritarian alternatives, whether in the form of religious fundamentalism or strident nationalism. This is what we are witnessing today. Three decades of market-driven globalization and technocratic liberalism have hollowed out democratic public discourse, disempowered ordinary citizens, and prompted a populist backlash that seeks to clothe the naked public square with an intolerant, vengeful nationalism. To reinvigorate democratic politics, we need to find our way to a morally more robust public discourse one that honors pluralism by engaging with our moral disagreements rather than avoiding them. Disentangling the intolerant aspects of populist protest from its legitimate grievances is no easy matter, but it is important to try. Understanding these grievances and creating a politics that can respond to them is the most pressing political challenge of our time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, and Michael will call on the questioners. Um, thank you very much, Usama Magdasi, a fellow here at the American Academy, and thank you for that talk. I guess my question is on the fourth point you raised about patriotism, and I'm wondering how you reconcile the call for a new form of patriotism, or is it an old form of patriotism, one with a history of race in the United States, racism, and the second with the history of nearly three decades of war in the Middle East, and on the Middle East, which by definition prompts xenophobia, a sense of you know, being under siege and so on and so forth. So how, how do you reconcile, or how do you bring in the history of war, three decades nearly of active US war in the Middle East with your call for patriotism? Well, not easily, not easily. That's why patriotism and nationalism are volatile um, uh, forces and aspirations. And precisely because they're bound up with war and injustice. We have a tendency, by we, I mean mainstream liberal thinkers and citizens, have a tendency to, uh, to try to downplay the place of patriotism or national community in politics because they are so dangerous and volatile and have such a, a, a history bound up with darkness. What I'm suggesting is that um, difficult though it is to try to articulate a pluralist conception of national community, it's even more dangerous to ignore it because unless um, we have open public debate about what pluralist conceptions of national community with a strong sense of mutual obligation among citizens might look like, that yearning, that aspiration will be answered, will be met by the, 
the uh, harsh xenophobic version of nationalism that we're witnessing today. Thank you very much for the very fascinating talk. How do you integrate into your criticism towards liberalism the European discussion, which I more perceive as a con combination of conservative moralizing and liberal economy? I think it has been a different discourse in the United States. But during the last, I would say, 10 years or eight years, the discourse about the problems in Europe in Germany was a very moralizing one, not in your sense of morality, but in the sense of those who lose uh, did not do well. And those who have gained, especially the societies which have gained, they have done well. The southern European countries, it's their fault that they are so badly because they were lazy, they were irresponsible, etc. So it was a discourse full of moral concepts. Hmm. How do you integrate that into your analysis? Well, may I ask you a I, question? I'm Gesine Schwan, and I'm yeah. a political scientist in yes. Berlin. Yeah, but before you give up the microphone, could I ask you the, the, uh, uh, the following question? Do you think, um, of course it's true, there are moralizing strands and elements in existing public discourse. Much uh, often they are, um, as in the examples you gave, uh, often they, they denigrate or criticize um, other peoples or other societies. Do you th think that the moral impulse in politics inevitably takes that form? Or do you think that there can be a morally robust kind of politics that is um, pluralistic and that encourages engagement with other societies, other cultures, and so on? Well, of course I do. Yeah. Uh, I, I do think that that is possible and yeah. even that it is needed. Right. But I am a little bit afraid of taking the concept of morality and moral judgments yes. and inclining more to Kant to make a difference between the legal and the moral judgments in the public sphere. And uh, there is a temptation in a kind of superficial concepts of morality to very quickly attribute failure, for instance, to moral uh, deficiencies, and this is right. a difficult point. Right. This is partly what I worry about in the account of meritocracy. There's the tendency, as more uh, with uh, as more meritocratic ideals take hold, for those on the top, to assume that those on the bottom are there because they lack the virtue of hard work or talent to succeed, and therefore they deserve it. This would be an example, I suppose, of the bad moralizing that you're worried about. And it's certainly true that moral argument in politics does take this form. Now, what would be the alternative? I suppose there are two possible answers. One would be a Kantian liberal answer, which would be to say, yes, we must have notions of morality and moral duty in politics. But it should be limited in, uh, limited to questions of legal rights, identifying individual rights, um, respect for persons as persons, respect for the human dignity and autonomy of persons. That's the kind of morality, the Kantian morality, that is safe, so to speak, to introduce into the public sphere. But it's safe because it's delimited. It doesn't enter into competing conceptions of the good life. It simply insists on the morality of respect for human dignity, let's say, and autonomy and the ability to choose. So that would be, uh, that you might call a robust Kantian liberal account of the role of morality in the public square. And I think that's inadequate. So you, you kind of forced me to. <laughs> Uh, to um, spell this out. I think it's inadequate. 
Um, and how can I come here to Berlin and criticize the great Immanuel Kant? That's almost <laughs> heretical. Uh, I think it's inadequate because it overly limits the, the, the scope of moral discourse in public life to restrict it to juridical rights, human rights, human dignity, important though they are. It leaves out competing conceptions of the good life. Um, and I think many of the questions we face, for example, how properly to accord respect to work, what kind of social esteem to accord to work, should we go for a universal basic income and, and let people go without work? Well, you could try to answer that from a purely Kantian abstract point of view, but I don't think we would get very far. I think we have to ask, does leading a good life include a life of work? And if so, in what sense of work? Well, this is a debate about how to live our lives. It's not just a juridical debate. It's not just a debate about individual rights that must be respected. So that's the kind of, um, uh, that's the kind of broader moral debate beyond the strictures of Kantian uh, human dignity that I think is required, which is why that version of liberalism, compelling though it is, I think, is not enough. Hello, I'm Jürgen Schläger. I'm a professor of, for British culture at the Humboldt University. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Actually, I didn't expect any difference, so <laughs> uh, that's it. But I do have a question. Uh, the, the structure of your argument was based on the fact that there are people who are dissatisfied, disenfranchised, uh, lower self-esteem, and so on. But the political establishment and the politics have changed and the economy have changed. Now, could, isn't it also relevant to see that aspirations, self-esteem, and all these categories have changed dramatically, particularly under the influence of the IT revolution and, and the global economy and so on. So uh, it, it, that would, of course, might cause or, or pose a problem for politic, for politicians all over the world to cope with a rising demand of uh, aspirations and expectations of, of the people. Uh, I think that is, seems to be something that you could, uh, a gap which you uh, could fill. Uh. Thank you for that. I, I think that the, what I refer to as the legitimate grievances of working people and middle class people who've seen wage stagnation, I think those grievances aren't fully captured by rising expectations that these voters have for themselves when they see through the internet or through cable television how other people live and are flourishing. I think it's not just that expectations have risen and it's difficult to keep up. Technology and the global economy are often pointed to by establishment, political parties, and politicians as if they are influences that are not themselves political, that come from outside to create new imperatives for the way we organize the economy and distribute the benefits of shared economic activity. And I, th I don't think that's, that picture is quite right. Technology in the form that we have it, including the kind of technology that increasingly seeks robots to do jobs and artificial intelligence to perform tasks that human beings traditionally performed, that's not a purely um, apolitical event like a change in the weather. It involves the commitment of enormous resources. It involves a, a set of ideas about what projects are worth pursuing uh, through technology and, and what one's less so. So I think part of, a, of an invigorated public discourse 
uh, should not just take for granted, and I, you may not have been suggesting that we do take for granted, but should not take for granted the direction of technology or of the global economy. These reflect political choices, sometimes implicit, but uh, sometimes explicit, and we should debate them as such. What avenues of technology will contribute to better lives and to, to a common good, and what may undermine it? We're beginning to have that debate now in the aftermath of, of the Facebook scandal, where we recognize, and uh, Jeff Zuckerberg, I think, as soon as this lecture finishes, we'll go before Congress to testify. There, he's, I think, waiting until we <laughs> adjourn tonight. But this highlights, this moment highlights that technology is not like the weather, something that just happens and then we scramble to respond politically. The course of technology, the uses to which it's put, these are political choices, not purely technical ones. And, and I, I'm hoping that what comes of the recent debate about social media and tech companies um, is to have a more direct, explicit, deliberate public debate about, the, about what we want technology to do for us and what forms we want technology to take and what regulations should channel technology in productive rather than destructive directions. Hello, my name is Kai Radilak, and I'm quite simply said a political citizen and a friend of ESPN. And uh, Professor, I really appreciated your talk or your speech, and I would like to raise a question, let's see, from an old world liberal point of view. An old the world Old liberal. world, Europe, for example. I see, uh, okay. Uh, the guys with uh, thousand years of histories, and the Please. question is, <laughs> <laughs> we need mostly, mostly. Uh, the, the, looking on the American liberalism, from our point of view, the, there might be also a point of view to say that American rebel liberalism is extremes is a greater danger for democracy, democracy as Trump and all the guys around it because what it's we a observe, greater, da greater, greater danger, danger yeah. absolutely greater danger because what we observe there's a tendency to negate opinion of other peoples to fight them with a rigorism which reminds us, let's say, of the way we uh, talk with each other, way we fight our disputes in the Middle Ages. Huh? So and. What do you think about this? That in the end, uh, there's a greater danger with the extremes of American liberalism, because the way they try to change the way we think, we should behave, than with these guys uh, around Trump and behind them. That's the question. Thank yeah. You. Well, by the extremes of American liberalism, I can only. What's that? I can only guess what you have in mind by that. Um, and I have two guesses. One, you might mean. Um, the extremes of neoliberal Washington consensus economic policy, or you might mean what some people mean by the extremes of American liberalism, the insistence on the politically correct. So I'm not sure which of those two worries you have. Uh, so I would, I would respond as, as follows. I think the, uh, the criticism th that I would make of American liberalism is to a large degree applicable to social democracy in Europe, which is an exhaustion of ideas that, both, that it, these are spent, in my view, spent ideologies that had a, uh, American liberalism and European social democracy had energy and moral purpose uh, in the years following the Second World War. Um, but that by the 80s and 90s, they were beginning to lose their sense of purpose and mission. These were the public philosophies that uh, in large part created the welfare state and many aspects of <laughs> decent societies in, in democratic countries. But debating the welfare state is now, and, and defending it in largely technocratic managerial terms, and embracing uncritically uh, market-driven versions of globalization, 
these positions represent the, the descent of liberalism in the US, social democracy in Europe, a, a, a loss of purpose. And I think voters sense this. Voters sense that American liberals and European social democrats have lost their way and have not found a voice or a language to address the big questions that matter now. That would, that's my, I suppose, criticism, my challenge to American liberals and to European social democrats. And it's, I think, a parallel predicament. Um, my name is Stéphane Dion. I am the ambassador, um, Canadian ambassador in Germany, the uh, uh, boat chapter uh, <laughs> for Canada. And in the literature about um, populism, um, it is usually identified as linked by two causes. The first one is uh, inequality, rising inequality, and loss of, of social mobility. The second one is the anxiety created by uncontrolled uh, migration or the perception that it is out of control and also uh, targeted to some communities, especially the Muslims, identified to uh, violent Islamism and then terrorism. Um, is it fair to say that in your presentation, the second cause is more a uh, result of the first one? And if it's the case, I would dispute that. I would say a country like Canada has been up to now, up to now, immune to this wave of populism, mostly because we don't have irregular immigration. We have three oceans as a neighbor, and the United States, one of the richest countries of the world. So it's helping us. Uh, if I look at Hungary, there is in Hungary there is no um, rising uh, inequality, or in Austria, it's not the main problem. It's quite flat. The main problem is the fear to lose their uh, national identity. And even though they, uh, in Hungary or in Poland, they don't have a lot of immigration, as we know, uh, uh, a skillful politician may use this fear, especially uh, toward non-Christian immigration, uh, to, 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 to be elected on xenophobia. So I, I think uh, we should not consider this second cause as only a consequence of, of the first, but maybe I did not, I did not understand what right. you wanted I, to say. Right, I agree it's not only, the second is not only a consequence of the first. I agree with that. Inequality and hostility toward immigrants, these are certainly two ingredients in the populist protest. But I think there is something more fundamental that connects with both of these two sources, and that's a sense of disempowerment and social exclusion. The fact that uh, large parts of the population have been left behind, not only in terms of the distribution of income and wealth, the first point, but more importantly in terms of social recognition and esteem, which connects to questions of political identity, but from the standpoint also of recognition and a sense of having a meaningful say in shaping the forces that govern the collective life, the question of, of disempowerment. And so I would say that rising inequality and increased levels of immigration have, in different ways, contributed to this sense of disempowerment in ways that uh, give rise to uh, fear about the loss of political identity. But I would begin with those larger tendencies, a sense of disempowerment, a f feeling that one is no longer accorded social recognition and esteem, and then try to trace what I think are multiple uh, causes for, for those conditions. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm Paul Ingendeyer of the Frankfurter Allgemeine. Thank you for this really inspiring talk. I would like to say something that that maybe you feel too. It's the odd sense of being comforted by listening to you and reading your books. And I'm trying to think why that is, because we don't have answers. And uh, we were here a year and a half ago, shortly after the election of Trump, and there was some kind of um, confusion and um, feeling of being lost. 
We talked about this earlier. Mm -hmm. when, when you call for analysis of what has happened to, with Trump <coughs> and with populism, with what we have to do now, um, you are also calling for some clear-cut vision or some politician yeah. who could take right. up you know, right. the challenge. But we don't see that. The only clear-cut people nowadays we see are really the other side. Trump, oh. Erdogan, Orban, who just won again, legitimately won again. One has to say that. So um, it seems just the opposite, that politicians are withdrawing from what you would like them do, giving battle. Why, why is that? Or is that just my feeling? Or can't they be heard? In the, in the din of, you know, others giving battle? I don't know. Well, given, uh, I agree with you that we've not heard, I've not been able to identify many compelling, fresh voices um, among liberals or social democrats to, uh, in a way that holds hope of reinvigorating uh, public discourse and addressing these grievances. I've not heard that. Now, why, has, why is that the case? Here I can answer mainly from the standpoint of the US, which I've been watching at close hand. I think it's, well, in general, I think it's partly that this requires an act of moral and political imagination that does not come easily to politicians, ever. <laughs> Politics is difficult that way. And, but it's also unpredictable when such figures may emerge. So that may be some cause for hope. So that's one observation. But there are powerful tendencies in the opposite direction, tendencies that just features of the current political arrangements that discourage a bolder moral and political imagination. And in my own country, this has partly to do with the, um, the hold of big money on politics, the, the, um, the need to respond to the donor class by American political parties, and this is true of Democrats and Republicans alike, exerts a powerful constraint on uh, moral and political imagination. And it puts, um, it creates incentives for parties and politicians who already have achieved office not to take chances, not critically to reflect on their own failings or the failings of their party, <coughs> but instead speaking now of the American case and of the Democratic Party in particular, to await deliverance from Robert Mueller. That's what it boils down to. And, and so there's, I think the Democrats are so earnestly hoping for Robert Mueller to save them, to deliver them from <laughs> this nightmare, that they are failing to ask hard questions about why people didn't vote for them for what they had to offer. Why they've lost most of the state legislature, never mind the presidency, never mind both houses of Congress. They've lost most state legislatures and most governorships. So Mueller isn't going to save them from that, whatever he does. And, and yet there's a tendency, given the uh, the self-conserving, uh, I would say, complacent tendency of parties who have been in, you know, in Washington, in this case, for a long time, not to be bold, which is why I think if there are to be such voices, they're less likely to come from Washington establishment Democrats than from the states, uh, from some governors maybe from the Midwest or West who have a fresh perspective and are less burdened by the stale formulas that um, have been tried again and again and again with less and less success. 
Now, you tell me that what I have to say is comforting. I hope <laughs> I, I don't want this to be sound too discouraging. But this, I think, is what would be required. And it can happen. I mean, it can happen. Barack Obama, who, who, of whom I had some criticism in the talk, and he, he came more or less from nowhere, a first-term senator from Illinois, not beholden in quite the same way, at least not then, to the system of campaign finance. And there could be others. Uh, I'm Kristen. Kristen. Yeah, I'm Kristen Monroe. I'm a political psychologist from the University of California, and I'm fortunate enough to be a fellow this semester. Um, thank you for your talk, which was um, so brilliant that I'm thinking that the person who was able to figure these things out in advance and respond to them uh, was someone who's very high in political imagination. And then I think of Donald Trump, and I'm having a hard time reconciling that brilliant politician who tapped into all these things that you have only now identified for us. And I'm having a hard time reconciling that with the Donald Trump that I read about in Fire and Fury, who seemed like nobody knew where to get to the door. And, and yeah. so I'm wondering um, how you reconcile those two images right. and which one is the true Donald Trump, because right. I think that relates very directly to the excellent question we just had, which is how you respond to it then in terms of someone who has a moral and political imagination. Right. I think part, a good part of political imagination and success um, derives not from political philosophy, Kantian or otherwise. Um, Trump certainly can't be accused of colluding with Kant or any philosopher, <laughs> ever. But sometimes political imagination comes from a keen intuition or instinct. And the one keen intuition or instinct that he has that fit the moment was understanding and actually sharing in a sense of humiliation. Now, it's paradoxical that a billionaire real estate guy from New York would have that capacity. But remember, he always felt himself humiliated in the face of Wall Street elites, New York elites. He always hankered after being accepted and recognized and being looked down upon. And even the banks, with one exception, which I won't mention, <laughs> did, would not deal with him, would not deal with him. So he had the accumulated grudges and grievances of a lifetime that just happened to coincide with this moment when the mainstream parties had a, had a tin ear to the politics of resentment and humiliation. So that's the only way, Kristen, that I can explain it. But he, he does, that's, that's the one thing he, he's good at because he, he feels it. And the people who voted for him sensed there was something authentic there. Well, putting all of the other stuff aside, the entertainment and the hucksterism and the carnival barker side, they saw that as amusing artifice. But they knew the one, the one authentic thing about him was this sense of, of grievance, of grudge, of resentment, of humiliation. And that's, that he comes by um, honestly, so to speak. <laughs> you think? You think? Elizabeth Pond, I'm a, a journalist and, and author here in Berlin. Let's suppose that Barack and Michelle Obama were in this audience. And they listened to you and they said, yeah, let's go back to that vision. How would you advise them to do it? I would, well, I would say, um, <coughs> instead of bailing out the banks, bail out the mortgage holders, the ordinary people who lost their homes. And instead of letting the banks off the hook at a time when the taxpayers essentially owned the banks, exercise 
public authority, uh, the voice of the taxpayer, of the citizen, to, um, to fire the um, management of the banks who engaged in the behavior that led to the financial crisis and put in a different management. That would be the second. The third I would tell them is, and while you're at it, make sure that the new management, of the, that you, that publicly accountable managers of the banks, not use their corporate uh, largesse to lobby against uh, reform of the financial industry. Um, and I would say, um, Mr. President, I voted for you twice. Um, and had great hopes, as we all did. But these were three big mistakes. And they came early. And they, um, th they undermined, in ways I don't think we fully recognized, the moral energy and the moral authority of his presidency, which had such hope in the, in the campaign. And I think it, it affected uh, the way the health care battle unfolded. I think it, it, his moral voice was muted actually in articulating why it was important to provide um, health care for everyone. Instead, he fell into, he, a, a master of rhetoric, soaring moral and spiritual rhetoric. Uh, when it came to defending health care, I was watching C-SPAN. I'm kind of a C-SPAN addict. That's where you see these unedited speeches of politicians. Making the case for health care, saying to an audience uh, somewhere, we have to bend the cost curves in the out years. This is technocratic talk. And I thought, no wonder he's having such trouble getting health care, getting support for health care. So what I would say would be, Maybe there is a war between your spiritual side and your technocratic side. Um, let the spiritual side prevail. That's what I would have said. Could I um, claim the privilege of the last question? Please. <coughs> Pardon me. Before we adjourn to a more informal conversation next door, and that is to cite a somewhat unpredicted element in, in, the, in this 50th anniversary season of many important events from 1968, including the university revolts, which in many ways really didn't go anywhere. Um, I'm thinking of the high school level <coughs> protests since the um, massacre, the latest school mm -hmm. massacre in Florida. And I'm curious as to your thoughts on the political legs, so to speak, of this new generation of people who are demanding certain rights and protections that have to do directly with them as, as children, really, and right. where, where this will go. Right. Well, thank you for that, Michael. Little is more inspiring in the current sorry state of American public discourse. Little is more inspiring than um, the young people, high school students from this Florida high school and then beyond throughout the country, um, rallying and creating a movement for serious gun control. What's, what I find inspiring about it, and here's an example of where a kind of rejuvenation might come. These kids are 17 years old. There was a town hall meeting. Now, the American media is large, like media in many countries, is, has been remiss in not creating more forums for serious public discourse of the kind that we've been discussing tonight and that I've been calling for. But CNN, to its credit, ha did have a forum, a town hall forum, with, in an arena with 7,000 or so people in Florida, many of them young people. And they had office holders, senators, including Marco Rubio, and others, uh, and, and a lobbyist for the, uh, for the NRA, for the National Rifle Association, on the stage, and had them questioned. Did you see this? Had them questioned by these 17-year-olds. And those 17-year-olds, some of them, asked harder, smarter, sharper questions of Marco Rubio and the NRA representative than any of the journalists the professional journalists had done, and then any of the political critics of the gun lobby had done. 
And they followed up. They were respectful, but they were strong. They pressed their point. And, well, Marco Rubio, who's quite an adept politician, um, a smooth politician, was floundering under the interrogation by a 17-year-old kid in Florida. And the 7,000 people in the arena were registering very powerfully. So that was a great moment. That was the kind of glimmer of the kind of awakening of the moral and political imagination that arise from unexpected directions. And in this case, arose from a horrific tragedy. But it was an almost redemptive moment, not because it will bring any meaningful gun control, sadly, I don't think it will in the short term. But because it's a stirring of a moral and civic energy that uh, provides an example uh, at a time when so much of politics is mired in technocratic managerial talk. And these kids and the 7,000 people in the arena and the people who watch them on CNN, even if, even if the gun lobby prevails this year or next year, um, that political moment and the possibility that it intimates um, may be the most important thing of all. Thank you all.